Hey, folks, welcome back to the Living in the Virtues of Your Strengths podcast. My name is Matt Engel. I'm a certified Gallup Clifton Strengths coach and also a certified Catholic mindset coach from Metanoia Catholic. So, this is where we see Clifton Strengths, those amazing talents come together and mindset coaching come together so we can understand what's the mindset that's driving these talents. Because we can go either way, we can go to a, a virtuous path that's really building up the kingdom of God, making saints, making a, like transforming us and making incredible contribution, living in that zone of grace. Or it could be something that goes very toxic, very vicious. When we can take some of those thoughts captive and see how we're showing up in our talents, we can start to choose those mindsets that are going to incline us towards that virtuous uh, showing up. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Thanks so much for being a part of the podcast. We've got other people that are on the call that are going to make this very educational and keep us focused, okay? Because that's the focus of today's podcast, the talent of focus. We're going to be looking at what drives the person with this signature theme and also where might they be showing up virtuously? What does focus virtuously look like? What does it look like viciously where we're in vice or in those overuse patterns as we hear in that more gallopy language? And then finally, what are the mindsets behind each of these that's driving them? Okay. So we're going to dive right into our scorecard here. We're going to our picture and then we'll open it up for contributing to that word picture on focus. All right. So just reading really off of what Gallup provides us, the person that is high in focus, what are they being? They are being intensely and intentionally single-minded. What are they doing? Persevering until the goal is reached. Not all the goals, but the goal, singular, is reached. I bring, what is their contribution? I bring clarity through concentration and direction. I need, what are those requirements that they are preferred ideal conditions to get the most out of this strength? I need a goal to establish priorities. Okay. I love what's the value that they want to preserve. I love to begin with the end in mind, right? I hate, again, Harkens back to what they love, but what do they, how do they want to protect it? I hate going off on misdirected tangents. That metaphor, image in the zone, and that barrier label, destination mentality may limit enjoyment of the journey. Okay. So moving into this, I mean, there are uh, looking at the call, there was an, a number of people that had this kind of in the middle of the pack. Some people, I'd say majority of people had it in the 20s. I know for me, it sits at 13. Abby on our team, it's number three. I wish she was on the call, but I can speak to my experience working with Abby. We just actually got out of a staff meeting. So I can certainly see where she starts kind of fidgeting a little bit when we're starting to go off on these tangents. And she's very quick. And I love this about her to be able to kind of put her hand up and very gently, because she's also very high harmony to say, hey, is this something we really want to focus on? Is this important? To really be discussing right now. And I love that. It's a great contribution to the team. It keeps us on track. Okay, so you're probably thinking of people that we've got uh, in your life that are high with the signature team. But here's what I got for the word picture today. And feel free to add in here. Okay, so first, I've got a little cup full of soda straws, right? Maybe you've heard of that soda straw mentality, you're looking through a soda straw at your world. This is what focus can do. It can be, I've got the horse with the blinders on, you know, the racehorse that has the blinders on, can't see anything to its side. It's just looking straight ahead. All right. That's kind of what focus would do. It really narrows the vision. All right. And it, it desires that because it, it's, it's again, an executor talent. It's in that execution domain because it wants to achieve a result. All right, we'll get into really the primary motivations here in a moment. But they've got that soda straw mentality. I've got the scope here, like the crosshairs, like you're aiming through a rifle. Again, you want to get pinpoint accuracy. You might be scratching your head and saying, why is there an elephant on this page? And it's kind of said, okay, well, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, All right. And so the way somebody with focus will approach a, pro a project is the one bite at a time for the project. I also have a big check mark on the page, and this is actually narrowed down from a page that had multiple check marks. Why? Just one check mark. That's what the person with focus is focused on. One goal, one aim at a time. And then you've got 
kind of the bazooka rocket launcher image, a couple of Marines that are firing a javelin missile. All right. Javelin missile is what we would call a fire and forget weapon. You aim, you click fire, it shoots, and then you can run away. You don't even have to focus anymore on the target because the javelin will continue to guide itself onto that target. All right. So this is what I got for the for the word picture. I, I, I like to call Hannah. She's she's 11 on focus on our team. We often refer to Hannah, maybe you've heard us say this before. She's a fire and forget weapon. What do I mean by that? I can say, Hannah, this needs to get done. And that's it. Very little supervision at that point. She finds a way to get it done. She's very high responsibility as well, high discipline. And you can see how that focus at 11 comes in and works for her there. Abby on the team, she's number three focus. She's also number one significance. She's also got harmony, as I mentioned before. She can really keep us on track. And she's number five command, I think, either four or five command. Or wait, hey, no, two. She's number two command, all right? So when we are straying from focus, Abby is very quick in a very harmonious way to bring us back on task. It's very helpful in the meetings. What else do we got? Let me see some hands. Who's got some? Corey, I know you had said something before about adding to this picture. What do you have? I think a map would be uh, something to use to focus on because there's always that end destination. And no matter where the road takes you on the map, um, as long as you stay on that route, you'll get to your destination. Fantastic. Okay. So staying on the route and there's two endpoints. And, and this really goes along with what you just uh, we just read that uh, I need those ideal conditions, a goal to establish priorities. So if the goal is the thing on the map, like, and the route are just the way that you're getting there, right? The priorities that you're knocking down in order to get there. Yes, we don't know how to prioritize if we don't have that destination on the map. Talia, you just came on and said that Coach Rosser, who's number five on focus, might be able to lend something. If he wants to come on here, I certainly open up the space for him to jump on here as well. Anybody else got something to add to focus? What would add to this focus word picture? I would Yoni, add, this is Janae. <laughs> I would go add um, uh, like a, a, a person that's like so focused on the task that the world could be falling down around them and they're not even paying attention to it at all. Like <laughs> explosions and fires and screaming people. And it's like, nope, like they're just, they're just like zoned in because that's how it shows up for me. I was thinking about that. Erin, my wife, it's low. I think for her, it's um, it's 27. All right. So she's getting up there kind of high. Uh, she always marvels at the fact that I could be sitting in the kitchen with focus at my 13. And, you know, even without it putting any earbuds in, I can, you know, our daughter can be watching TV or yelling, stuff like that. And I can stay zoned in, right? It's not really an ideal condition for me, but she kind of marvels at that. Michelle, what do you got? I would say you could add an arc. I think of Noah as being singularly focused. He was given a mandate, right? He was given a goal to build that arc. And he got all kinds of flack and was made fun of. And he just stayed the course. Unflappable. Stayed the course. Like that's a great, I love that kind of, that That could be almost like the, the metaphor image, staying the course, staying the course. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Talia, I saw a hand up for a second there. Yeah, I was going to talk more about how I've seen it, but I don't have an image to add to it, so <laughs> we can wait. Let's hear it. Yep. No, go you ahead. Let's hear, hear it. it. Yeah, okay. I do. So Coach Rosser has like a checklist to do every day. He calls it his win list, and he's right here, by the way. Um, <laughs> but when he sets time to like get that done, he's zoned in and all in. And he's basically like before when we didn't communicate this, I'd like turn because I'm like high connectedness and relator and like relationship. So I'd like turn and start asking questions and he like wouldn't respond for a little bit as he zone in or like, I didn't always feel like he was fully present. But then once we've learned more about it, it's been helpful. And he'll be like, okay, I'm, I'm like zoning in, like, this is my time to like, so that communication has been really helpful. But a lot of times, he'll be like deciding I'm gonna go in the zone and like, do check off the win list. And like, I'm going to finish all these tasks. And then mm -hmm. like a player 
will walk in just to like come hang out and like he he just like it's you can see the pull of like him like (laughs) wanting to be present to them because they're visiting but then also like kind of like also like worrying about his tasks and so me I'm like hello and I'm fine (laughs) to stop my work and like spin around (laughs) and let go of the work is that um, him behind you right now? It is. Just like totally ignoring this conversation that's talking about <laughs> I'm, him. I'm listening. I'm not ignoring. <laughs> we are breaking his Tyler's focus right now. <laughs> I'm not in my focus mode. I'm in my listening to Talia mode, which is always entertaining. <laughs> Wait, it's so, interesting, Talia. One of the things you brought up, you said he's he's just not present, but the reality is that he's very present, but he's present to the task mm-hmm. that he's chosen to be the priority right then in that moment. And again, what, like they're very present, people high focus, very present to the priority that they have set in that moment that's nested within that greater vision, that greater goal that is like the end focus in mind, the end state in mind, right? So it's very interesting that we're seeing a little interplay here where Tyler on certainly his melancholic side, his melancholic and kind of the, the phlegmatic side of him as well. And then also Talia on like this very sanguine side, the personality where, yeah, I just want to like in a lot of orange themes for you in the top, a lot, a lot of orange and blue. Tyler, I know he's got some blue up there as well, but like there's, there's like this, Talia is just like, as soon as somebody comes in front of me, that's my focus, right? And then there's, but there's, there's a freedom that kind of comes from there and you can see how there's a benefit to that, but we can also see how that could not lead to ultimately getting something tangible accomplished if we're constantly disrupted. So there's a beautiful both and. I mean, I'm so happy to see that you guys are in the same room together and like doing this work and you can kind of be be in that uh, for whoever walks in the room as well. Bring both those combined gifts together. What a great compliment. Yeah, and so now with the self-awareness, he'll now like tell the players like, hey, I'm here, but like, I want you to know, like, I have these things to do. And if you really need me, like you can talk, but I am going to be focused on this, but I'm here if you need me. And then I'm just like all in. So it's been, the self-awareness has been super cool. Yes. So like you start to even get into those ideal conditions. It's like, what are the, what are the boundaries look like for somebody that is, you know, that is, wants to guard that focus? Because again, there's such a motivation, deep motivation to stay on task and arguably, if, if you just kind of have loose boundaries, it's not really seeing and loving and protecting this part of you that's very that's very important. It's, that really, it's it's not allowing it to show up in gifts, right? The actual accomplishment piece. So I can imagine yeah. that balance is an important, important thing. He, he's willing to speak really quick. If you want. You Of course. Yes. You yeah. You may speak. The floor is yours. We're glad to have your I'm focus. At- Hey, Tyler, good to see you, man. <laughs> yeah, you too. So real quick, so the boundaries I think is really important because like the whole reason we coach is about the women, right? So like helping the women get to heaven, like that's our that's our main purpose. And so you can't really do that if all you're focused on is tasks because it's about them. But I think also using like those strengths is so important. So like if someone walks in and, and it's it's just random and we haven't scheduled it, like that's something where I feel like I have the freedom to say, hey, Talia's is here, I'm going to engage in this work. However, we also have office hours set up throughout the week for like three hours at a time. So I know, okay, like those are office hours for the women to come visit. So they actually take priority because we're inviting them in and we're giving them the freedom to come in. And it's even though maybe like at a random time, we know this is their time to talk to us. So even if I'm working on a task in that moment, now I know that, okay, actually what's most important now is the woman in front of me because th- this is her office hour time where if it's outside of the office hours i feel like i can say hey like this is my focus time if that makes sense so those boundaries i think matter super important yes what what was what was amazing is how you immediately led out with the goal the goal is to help these women Tyler and, and Talia are the coaches of the women's soccer team at Ave Maria University. The goal is to help these women get to heaven through this modality, you know, of being a varsity athlete, a varsity soccer player. And so just there, everything you said, like, that's the goal. And then the boundaries that Tyler and Talia have structured in kind of the interplay between the two of them was based on that goal, had that goal in mind. So it's like, even if I'm shifting my focus in the moment, 
I've created some structure that allow me the freedom to do that without sacrificing movement towards that goal. Because it's not just being present, getting them to heaven isn't just about getting like talking to them whenever they want. It's also about like, you need to, you need to win soccer games, keep your job, <laughs> you know? So like, that's a part of it too. And so there's, there's kind of that beautiful balance that's, that's there uh, that I'm hearing with this. Tyler, thanks so much for hopping on. Anything you. else you want to add? Nope. Good. Thanks, awesome. Matt. Thanks guys. Awesome. All right. Jane, I'll let you close up and then we're going to jump over to the motivation side. Yeah, real quickly, I just wanted to share uh, when Talia was talking years ago, my, my husband was the Cubs master uh, for Cub Scouts, and he was very focused on the night that he had Cub Scout pack meetings, and I learned to make a way for him. So before he came home, I would make sure dinner was ready. I literally would like tell the kids, like, move out of his way so he can get out the door. And when he had that space to be focused on getting to the pack meeting, having all of his, you know, material ready and da 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 da, he was so much better when he came home. And there wasn't any, you know, oh my gosh, where's this and where's that? And I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was mm -hmm. actually facilitating his focus. So that is something if, if those of us who, because I'm 25, so focus isn't as high, I, my husband hasn't done the strength, but I'm guessing that he has a pretty high focus, um, is a way to attribute, just like Talia was saying about with coach, he's focused, so she takes the lead on and interplaying with the, with the players. So it is that give and take when we understand where, where that is and who needs to be the focus and how do we support that person. What's amazing too, and is that like, you were kind of living in your area of giftedness, right? Like you've got, are, are you, your command, right? You've got some high command in there or am I, to, no, I'm out. Strike that from command the record. Like 31 right. or okay. Never mind. Never mind. But like, I, I, let's, let's go back to uh, coach, coach and, and Talia, right? There's, there's like, I can see how Talia's very sanguine, very relationship folk, like fronts, um, strengths, there's a space that when she steps into those, it creates a space for Tyler, her counterpart, to enter into his focus. And there's a beautiful, there's like a beautiful complementarity. When we step into our gifts, we always create space for somebody to, to step into their gifts, right? And so, again, we've got the goal to, to help people get to heaven across the board. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves, always. We're always going to be doing this in communion. Okay. Let's jump forward. Thank you so much, Jane. Let's jump forward here. This is my this is my shot in the dark here for the motivation for the person that's high in focus. I know Tyler, you're listening in the background here, so I'm curious what you think, as you're the highest person with focus in the call at the moment here. Delivery on expectations. So it's not just achiever. It's not just getting it done. It's not just checking the box, but it's getting it done to standard. So there's a level of detail to getting it done. The goal is something that needs to be very clear. The clearer the goal, the more I can really focus on what is important and account for all the details that fall under the umbrella of getting it done. Some thoughts here on this. Now I'm going to throw it out. Michelle, I, know, I always like opening the floor and creating some space uh, because you're, you know, just a seasoned coach in the strengths. And I also love building up a whole lot of hype for you to be able to deliver on an expectation here as well. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Michelle. I like that, Matt. I like the delivery on expectations and it's very time bound. And while you're talking about some of these pairs, um, Abby and Mark and Talia and her coach, well, coach. her co-coach, <laughs> Complementarity. Can you imagine if if everyone on the team were execute focused, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I like your delivery on expectations, and I like that it's tempered or complemented by people who can then bring in the relationship piece or even maybe an influencing piece. Um, yeah, because it's time bound. It's it's I get this done, not necessarily we need to get this done. Great. 
I hear you saying time bound in there. Time bound is just like that's that's part of the detail of what done looks like. So it's not just done whenever it's done on a certain timeline. I remember when I created for Abby a 30, 60, 90. And when she first joined the team and she was just like, oh, let's do this. I love it. I love it. I love it. And it was just a great little touchstone for her to be able to come back and, and, you know, point to those things. Uh, so there's clarity on really what the expectation was. I also noticed that when clarity is not there, it's lacking. This can be something that is a little bit triggering for, uh, for focus because they don't really understand what the expectation is. If it's just done, that's okay, but they really want to just know that, okay, just check the box anywhere within the left and right lateral limits of this standard. It's a wide, it's a broad standard that done looks like great. But if you can get that soda straw uh, picture of what done looks like, again, they know how to prioritize their time, what's important, what's not important. So Matt, would it be, um, if you were going to juxtapose that with discipline, discipline wants to know the plan to get it done, the how of getting it done. And then focus wants to know when I'm done. I think I, I, I like, I like that focus. I want to know when I'm done and discipline. Yes. It's like discipline is one of those things where it's, it's kind of a habitual way of doing things. Right. And so if you're doing something just once, uh, I think focus could be really good at that. Like, but it, discipline always wants to uh, process, turn something into a process, a repeatable process to get a predictable result. And so if it's you put somebody on uh, that's high focus to develop a repeatable process, say you have an onboarding you know, process. That was one of the things that we had for Abby. Like whenever we're onboarding new resident coaches, I said, please build an on, that was part of her 30, 60, 90, develop an onboarding process. And her and Hannah with discipline at number one, got very detailed on the steps to that process. And it was on paper. It was mapped out in our project management software. There was a flow to it. You knew when you were being called to do your part in the, like everybody knew their place in that onboarding system. And so you saw the beauty of where focus comes and meets discipline on creating repeating processes, like standard operating procedures. It was pretty solid. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts on this, folks, or you want to jump into the Lexio? Let's do it. Let's jump into Lexio. Okay. So I, I wanted to this. This was this was this is a scripture that comes back to me personally quite a bit, and it just for me it screams focus. It's Isaiah chapter fifty verse seven. And to give a little bit of context, we read this one quite a bit around the passion. And it's really, I remember Isaiah is, there's a lot of really clear, direct references to the Messiah. Um, what roughly six, was it 600 years before Christ that the book came, that he, uh, Isaiah, the prophet was around. Okay. And so it's the scripture where it's saying, I gave my back to those who beat me and my beard, my face to those who plucked my beard and spat upon it. So we see, we know that we're ta it's talking about Christ here. So in Isaiah 50, verse seven, it says, the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I will not be put to shame. I have set my face like flint. And I know that I will not be put to shame. When you think of flint, like the stone, the flint stone, you strike at it and it's, it's when, it, when it doesn't give, like there's a spark, right? It's something that's meant to be struck, right? And when you set your face like flint, your face is fixed in a direction. And even if it's struck, it stays on course. That's kind of what I'm, that's the imagery that's coming to mind here. Other writers have said this face like flint is Christ getting zeroed in on the cross. His focus is his goal, which is redeeming mankind. 
and I was sharing a little bit before the call that at Caesarea Philippi, right, that place on this rock, I will build my church, right? This The famous, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the one who is coming, the son of God, the one who is coming into the world. And he says, you know, flesh and blood not, has not revealed this to you, but but the heavenly father has revealed this to you. And you are Peter, Petra, he gives him that new name, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the hell shall not prevail against it. And then he talks about his passion. It's the next thing he shares. And here, the northernmost part of his journey, when he starts moving from that point, he's moving towards Jerusalem. He's turning back, coming back down, and he's making his way south towards Jerusalem. His face set like flint, moving back towards something that he's not really looking forward to, but he's really looking forward to. And I think this is where focus, you know, we look, we look to scripture to inform us on how might we live out this focus talent virtuously. Oftentimes, focus can keep our eyes fixed on a prize that is going to be arduous. The journey there is going to be arduous. It's going to be challenging. You know, I wonder if people that are high in focus are also high in fortitude. They can be very steadfast. How's this scripture hitting others on the call? I see a lot of very pensive looks. Corey, how's this landing? At, at first, it didn't make sense to me until you spoke about it. And then when you mentioned that face was like Flint and kept his eye, it's almost like he knew what he had to go through and he wasn't looking forward to that. But he saw beyond that to having the kingdom filled with God's children. Mm. Saw beyond that. Saw the goal. Saw the the end. <clears throat> yes, but he knew what it was going to take. So, mm -hmm. like he said in the garden, you know, if it's your will. But I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, so it's hard to quote scripture. Um, no, that's okay. You know, about if if it's your will, but it, something about let this cut pass before me. You know. Yes, yes, we certainly see the humanity of Christ that despised the cross, right? As we, as St. Paul shares, he despised its shame, didn't really look forward to it. The human side of us does not want to die. We know that we are not created ever to die. And so we despise death. It's very human to despise death. But again, something you shared, Corey, he still looked past that and he could see, he knew the fullness of the story. And this was just, you know, he kept his face on flint. On Maybe it's not the cross. Maybe it was everything beyond the cross even. Go ahead, Corey. So what came to mind also as you were talking about that is I have a little saying about the only way out is through. Mm. It really is just like the serenity prayer. Um, when we, you read more into the serenity prayer, is that let the hardship be a pathway to peace. Mm. Beautiful. Let the hardship be a pathway to peace. And we start to see here, I think, a, a glimmer of, of not focusing on what is arduous, but focusing on the fullness of the story, the victory. And so focus perhaps can go very toxic if it's just focusing on the gap. If focus is focusing on the pain, on the struggle, on the sacrifice. However, if focus is focused on the goal and the goal is clear and it's clearly something that is very desirable. I think we can kind of see how that could be something that inclines focus to show up very courageously. Any other thoughts on this scripture before we move on? Okay. I do. It's okay. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Yep. Whenever you had, you were explaining Flint and everything, um, you know, if it's used to set the fire, it brought up the quote from um, St. Catherine of Siena, be who God meant for you to be and it'll set the world, world on fire. And, and I think um, that would take something that's very focused. So having that, you know, like when you were explaining everything with the Flint, 
it, it's to make that fire, it's to make that light, it, it, and, and that's who Christ is, you know, and if we're standing in that light, you know, being who we were created to be, using these gifts, being in that focus, because I know I'm like a 17, so <laughs> it's something I have to work on a little bit more to, um, mm-hmm. and I'm learning about that in this, it just uh, really, really brought that up to me. It just, that that's what's resonating with me the most is that specific quote um, mm. and that calling to focus, to be in that light and to do what I'm called to do for him. Yes. Be you be who you are called to be and you'll set the world on fire. I mean, think about that. Like then it's just like, what is, what am I called to be? Who am I called to be? We've got a knit, a niche workshop that we're, we're going to be rolling out sometime in early March. That's really for helping coaches to land on their, their niche. It's like, okay, who am I called to be? Who am I, how am I called to show up? And there's something, as soon as we dial in on that, the, who am I statement, what is my God given name? Revelations two, what's that name that's written on the white tablet for me? When we have that, when we have that identity and then we preserve that identity we know that that's it's worth preserving because we do set the world on fire and we experience setting the world on fire awesome all right any other last thoughts here all right let's jump into what this looks like if we explore what focus looks like virtuous or vicious okay so we um when we look at the virtuous side when we're looking at virtue, like virtue always sees the other person and acknowledges their gifts and allows you to be seen, allows you to see yourself and acknowledge your own gifts. It leads to complementarity. In this case, it leads to interdependence. And this is how the body of Christ is meant to exist, not in competing, not in, you know, some sort of, you know, I jealousy, right? St. Paul talks about this and how silly it is for the hand to wish it were an eye or a foot or something like that. No. So when we come to know who we are and the gifts that's and, and make space for somebody to live in there, that's where we're seeing this interdependence. So what does it look like for focus? Here's what I think. When we stay in our lanes and have a shared goal, we can accomplish great things together. So we stay in our lanes Right? We know what our contribution is and what we are responsible to deliver on, what our individual focus is to move the mission forward and have that shared goal, that shared end, the shared vision. And it's something I'm only learning to appreciate how important it is to have clarity of vision because when you don't have clarity of vision, you have hesitation of buy-in. People are kind of, they're they're like, I don't know if I want to will that forward, but we can accomplish great things together, right? Now flip that over on the vicious side that can lead to independence. I do what I'm told, right? I get done what I need to get done, but it doesn't really matter what anybody else gets done. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm checking my own box. And we can see there's a way of even without any sort of consideration to what's going on around us. All right. I just do what I'm told. Focus that shows up dependently. Somebody tell me what to focus on. I can't act. I can't act with any sort of focus until somebody else tells me what to focus on. I'm now dependent on this person to give me clarity. There's no ownership that's there. Okay, and then finally, the codependence. Everyone picks their own focus and everyone does their best. Now, this may seem kind of like, how does this like codependent? Now, codependent relationship is when either party gets some sort of benefit, but at the end of it, nobody's really growing. Nobody's being challenged. Nobody's really being seen. Okay, so here we're thinking in the context of a team where everybody wants to look busy, everyone wants to keep their job, and everyone wants to get their credit, and everyone wants to kind of focus on what they feel like focusing on, but nobody wants to deviate their focus from what they think is important to do what is most important for the group. And we just kind of fall back on this mentality, well, I'm doing my best. How's this landing? Does anybody build on these 
any sort of construction. Jane, anything that you could add to this? Yeah, I was just thinking um, on the lead to dependence, it was really kind of challenging me because one of the things on the motivation on the delivery of expectation, I found that when I, um, when I began to decide to homeschool, I realized I was not capable of creating a curriculum. I wanted the recipe. I wanted somebody to tell me day one, open this page and say this to the student. Um, and once I found that curriculum, then I had the leniency of creating it in my own way, but I needed some sort of guidance. I needed some sort of focus. I needed some sort of discipline because all of those now I know all of those things are my lower strengths. Um, so when you say somebody to tell me what to focus on, it, it kind of grates on me to say that I'm, I'm dependent, but at the same time, I'm like, hmm, I am kind of dependent because I do need somebody to tell me what to focus on. But once I latch on to what I need to focus on, then I can go. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if I'm making sense at it, all. But it does. It does. And maybe this maybe this will clarify. Okay. So like somebody that is somebody that I'd say was it would be dependent with their focus. They don't take any personal responsibility to act or to find the focus if it's unclear. All right. So it's more so of like a passive, well, nobody told me. And so therefore I didn't act. I didn't really work towards any sort of prioritization. Does somebody think there's a better description here for it? I, this one was kind of a little bit tough for me, I'll admit. So if there's something that like is a better example, dependence usually shows up in, I need somebody to do something else so that I feel a certain way. And so what, let, let me just clarify what you're saying is um, because it's a vicious side, it's abdicating our own free will to another and putting the dependence on someone else. Whereas what I was trying to do is I wanted to keep my own power. I just knew my own limitations. Is that what you're, is that, would that be a fair thing? Hmm. So I, I think it's, I think, okay, so you the you wanted in in your case here you wanted to have the confidence that you were moving towards a clear goal okay but you kind of built that vision through your own research and through your own kind of study with that right so you were working towards it versus I'm just going to sit and spin in confusion and I don't know what the focus is. I don't know what the goal is. And now like I'm a victim to my focus, right? Because focus, it's hard for focus to act without clarity of vision. Like I, I think that's kind of, that's a common experience to somebody that's, with, that's high in focus. But like I'd say what you entered into, Jane, was a little bit more of an interdependent relationship where somebody was contributing, you recognized your own kind of lack, but then you sought out somebody that could fill that poverty and you entered into a relationship, whether it was just a Google search or what, but you started to kind of enter, you got, they helped you get clarity of that vision and, and move forward at that point. How's that okay. land? Yeah, that, that definitely lands uh, okay. much more clear and, um, so yeah, okay. So so again, it's that victimhood. It's really the it's the it's the abdicating the power mm -hmm. to someone else is where because it beca that's where the viciousness becomes is mm -hmm. not locus of control. I'm not still in control. I'm abdicating that control to someone else, and therefore, mm -hmm. well, I don't want to focus on because nobody told me what to focus on, so I'm not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. And you're, you're just there passively waiting. You're dependent on someone else to give you a focus and tell you what to focus on. Right. Like there's, we, we can't just say that we can't abdicate our responsibility for choosing, choosing that, like the reality that we're self-deterministic. Again, we, we fall back on John Paul II's personalism. That's, that's an important tenet that the, the human person is self-determining within, within boundaries. Right. So that means we can choose 
our focus, we can choose a goal or an aim. And in fact, we need, we, we have a responsibility to do that. And if we're just waiting for somebody to give us that aim, arguably we're, we're violating our own dignity or we're not fully stepping into it. Michelle, I've seen you kind of nodding here. And I, is there anything that you can add to this before we kind of push into the, the mindsets behind this? I'm just, I'm just agreeing. I love the way she wrapped up the understanding of dependence as victimhood mentality and just mm -hmm. waiting for someone else to give you what you should do. And, and JP2's, you know, self-determinism is, is perfect for that. I'm just nodding mm -hmm. in agreement. <laughs> okay. All right. This, this is me seeking affirmation from somebody who I know loves to give it. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Talia, you got a hand up. Um, Coach Roger is actually on a recruiting call, so if you hear noise, I'm sorry. Um, okay. He's focused. Um, he's focused. <laughs> but I was thinking about when you were talking about the leads to codependence, everyone picks their own focus and does their best. It kind of reminded me of relativism, just kind of like you do you. Um, like if you finished your task and your focus, like great for you. If you don't, like doesn't affect me, like that's your business. Um, so that, that was just a thought that kind of popped in my mind. I was like, oh, I wonder if it's kind of, I don't know if I'm wrong, but that's the thought that popped in my mind. Yeah, I, I think there's there's certainly some resonance of relativism that's in there because yeah, it's you're you're not being obedient to some absolute goal that you're pursuing together. And again, this doesn't lead to a loving relationship. A shared goal is the foundation of a loving relationship, right? It's it's we have a shared vision, a shared vision of the good. It's a common good when it's shared. It's a common good, and when we're all independently and freely pursuing it together. Right, where it's going to lead us to interdependence when it's done in freedom, and it's going to lead to willing the good of the other when we share the good of the other. Right, it's the foundation of a loving relationship. So codependence never leads to a loving relationship. Okay, looking at the mindsets behind this, right? There's always a thought that drives the way that these themes can show up, either viciously or virtuously. So we just looked at some outcomes of what it may look like on the on the uh, on the vicious or the virtuous side so like what are the mindsets that are behind it i i think on the virtuous mindset side uh i like the ready aim fire right <laughs> that you hear so like ready is everyone ready and on board with the mission right we've got a vision we've got a mission we have clarity here are you ready that's an important piece to make sure there's clarity of vision all right aim does everyone know their target? Does everyone know their swim lane? Does everybody know that what's expected of them down to the details, what winning looks like within their swim lane and how that contributes to the, to the success of the whole? And then fire. Did everyone hit their target? Did it get the result that we were looking for? Have we arrived at our destination? Or do we need to aim again? Do we need to adjust our aim? So again, it's sticking with the focus, clarity of what the goal is, clarity of what everybody's purpose is, and then the accountability that everybody's done what they said they were going to do. I also like the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me on the paths of righteousness. I, I really think that the redemption of the church and the renewal of the church will happen as quickly as the individual members of the church submit to the Holy Spirit. I think that's it's a race to the individual members of a church submitting to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Each one of them entering into that relationship where the vine and the branch are one. And just like Jesus, I only say what the Father in heaven says. And we operate the same way. Jane, I see a hand up. Well, you and I can relate to this. I don't know if anyone else, but this totally reminds me of a really good op plan because when you're in the military and you have a really good op plan and it goes down to the lowest level, everyone is on board with the mission. Everybody knows their target. Everyone knows where to hit the target. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, everyone also knows, you know, this is my lane, but, you know, war is war, right? 
if you're a, if you if you die, I know how to pick up the piece and continue on. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I remember, you know, before you were born, when I was in the military, the, when I had a good op plan, when there was a, someone who led a good op plan, it was like, yeah, that everything went well. And when the leader didn't have a good op plan, it was it was chaos. Yeah. It's poetry, though, when it goes well. I remember one of my instructors saying with lots of expletives, but very energized about it, how beautiful it was when you saw like an executed battle plan. It was just it was like a symphony. And you think of that everybody in a symphony is operating on what? The same sheet of music, right? That's what focus desires to be working on in a team. Veronica. You've broken the top 10 with your focus at number nine. So please contribute. Yeah, I just wanted to share. I, um, I echo with a lot of what was already said. Um, as someone really high in focus, um, I guess one of the things that I've needed to be aware of and mindful of is I'm also very high in responsibility and achiever. And so sometimes what I've fallen in the habit of doing when I wasn't clear about, you know, what is my lane, you know, what's my specific focus, um, I would take on more than I should be doing, which actually led to codependency and dependency, which isn't good. I'm not, it's not good for me and it's not good for other people. So that's a way that I've seen that I've needed to temper my focus because if I'm too focused and I'm not um, allowing other people to kind of step in and they're do their part or doing it for them, um, I'm not helping them or myself. And then that's where, um, when we were talking about the boundaries and needing the space, um, I need that people like me who are high in focus need the space to be able to work on what we're doing so that we can then work with people who are influencers and executors to be able to um, implement what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I just echo with a lot of what was said and, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think the clarity really comes from knowing what your unique piece is and really just staying, like you said, in that lane, because once you start veering off that path then it can, it could lead to the vicious side. Right. So. Yes. Veronica, I love how you said, uh, I love how you said staying in your lane but like creating space, like creating that ideal space for focus. When, if you are creating an ideal space for your focus to really show up in its all, in all its glory, can you give us a little bit of an education? What does it look like and how can, so we can kind of start to help create that space, perhaps to people that are high in focus. So for me uh, personally, I need like an environment where I have, either a lot of, I don't want to say quiet, but just like a solid like hour or whatever, just time of like no interruptions, no, I don't know if that's selfish, but just really kind of in the zone kind of thing. Um, that's kind of more environmentally. And then more on a kind of practical level, just really um, clarity on, um, like you were saying earlier, just what are the expectations? Um, you know, who's, who's responsible for what area. And then by sort of narrowing it down to like those couple of things, then that person can really go in like in a zone and then they can, from that, hopefully, you know, work with other people to be like, okay, now you take this and run with it kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Um, That's kind of the way that I approach it. Um, And yeah, and just sort of, yeah, but, but not feeling guilty about making that space to be able to really kind of hone in and, uh, um, you know, really focus on the task at hand or the goal. So yes, creating that space. And even like you think of the mind space for this, a couple of things that you shared going alone, going into my, you know, quiet room, is it selfish, you know, as kind of one of the words that you threw out there or feeling guilty about that. And, and again, like it, this, we don't pick our ideal conditions. Right. It's, I think it's, it's, it's not just mindset. Mindset can help, but if you're operating in a really noisy room and you have to do something that takes quite a bit of mental energy, then 
arguably you are going to be very, very, very exhausted when you're done with that versus, and it's going to take a lot longer to get done. And it doesn't mean that you have poor mind management at that point. It's just, it's literally where we are. This, and this is like grounding ourselves in the humanness, the bodiliness, the objectivity, the objective reality of who we are. Like our brains respond to stimulus. When kids are screaming, even if it's a playful scream, there's a little bit of puppy dog that starts running around in our chests, right? There's a little bit of agitation that goes there. It's, it's just part of who we are. And so I, I think creating a little bit of space for us, which it sounds like, and a little bit of grace to say, hey, you know what? And just, just acknowledge it for what it is. These are the ideal conditions and not apologizing for them, but just saying this is, and this isn't even selfish. This is allows me to show up in the best self gift. It's actually the opposite of selfishness. This allows me to be the greatest gift, the greatest contributor to the team. I, I, I think that's there, there's something very human with that. Now, doesn't mean that we're, we're not in our ideal conditions. It's licensed for us to sin, but that might turn into a near occasion of sin. All right, something to be aware of for us. Okay, awesome. Folks, thank you so much. Closing thoughts. Any other, any other closing thoughts here on focus? I love kind of in our closing thoughts, and maybe just what are, what are some of the ideal conditions that we're picking up on today? That whether we have focus, how are we going to love ourselves more in that focus, or how are we going to create space for somebody on our team that's or our, our family that's high focus to be able to really lean into that that giftedness of their of their talent? What do you think? I'm going to call on you if you don't if you don't step on here, Corey throwing you under the bus. Corey, what's something? You, but you know, Corey, I call on you because you're always very attentive. I'm building up the, uh, I'm <laughs> building up the expectation here. And, and you seem to, at the end of these things, have, have a, a new wrinkle in your brain, something to share. What'd you pick up today? I picked up quite a bit from um, Mama Jane's example about uh, dependence and, and like how, how that played out, what you shared it wasn't really like a dependence thing where it was a passiveness. It was a dependence. It's like this other person has a gift of putting that curriculum together, but you are taking the action to put it into place. So I just, I just loved that exchange about how these work together so beautifully. Mm -hmm. And that also there's just so much freedom that comes from learning about these things overall. Mm -hmm. um, freedom to, to exercise our gifts, to understand them more um, so that we can, like you said, show up as the best gift possible and to give other people the space to do, to learn about their gifts. So I just, mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating. And I learned fr something from everybody. I mean, I'm always taking just a ton of notes from what everybody's saying. <laughs> so thank you for doing awesome. this. Awesome. You bet. You bet, Corey. Yeah. I, I tell you what, for spouses to learn this about about their spouse, it's like, okay, say if your spouse is trying to, to really grow in their prayer life and their high focus. I mean, silence is, you, you can't, silence is essential to prayer. But for the person with focus, maybe they only need a little bit of silence. Maybe they just need a half hour. How might you create that half hour of space for your spouse to really get focused on their relationship with the Lord? Janae, I see your hand up and then Talia will have you come in. Yeah. Um, I uh, focus is at 11. It's my second executing strength. So achievers 10 focus is 11. I think I've spent a lot of uh, today was helpful in like breaking some of the narratives. I think I've told myself over the years, like that I can't focus very well or, um, that I struggle with distractions, which is true. Uh, so I think that's been one of my lessons of strengths over the last year is learning a little bit how to let these like lesser themes that are still very, very powerful, um, take a step up when needed. And I think it's been interesting because I've been working a lot on goal setting in the last month or two. And I can see now how like that's going to really help me dial in this talent of focus in a way that I probably haven't accessed before. Um, and I, I can see how like this particular strength is a little bit more on the vicious side than it is on the virtuous side at this point. Um, so yeah, it was a very helpful call to sort of um, think about all the ways that like <laughs> it shows up viciously. Um, I like how Achiever and Focus both have a common theme of um, like the task being more important than the people 
uh, or the like in the end goal is the most important thing. Um, and mm -hmm. I can see that showing up viciously a lot in my own parenting, uh, in my own family life. So yeah, it's been a really interesting call today to consider uh, all of those pieces. So Jane, or, or Janae, even thinking about your high ideation and your high intellection uh, and your high input, like that can take you. So you can, you know, remember the, the uh, leading with strategic themes, we want a clear conceptualization. We want a clear vision in mind. Like for you, that clear goal could be something that is constantly being refined and may even be shifting quite a bit. Versus mm -hmm. something, and so that, like the 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 object of focus, like what would it? And focus really needs a clear goal. And so, what does it look like then for you to give something for focus to latch on and get a win with, right? Mm -hmm. And and it might be something even in closing the good idea box, which may be a challenge, but it creates space for focus to actually get done, right? And so there may be some temperance over here on one gift in order for the other gift to come forward and get the job done. Yeah, How's absolutely. That land? Yeah, okay. it, it really resonates. I've been reading a book called uh, Building a Second Brain by Tiago Forte. And um, I was appealed to it because of my high input. And I love, he has this idea, he talks about convergence and divergence of ideas. And, and I forget which is which, but it's basically like there's a phase of a project where we're taking in all the information. And then there's a, it's really actually very challenging to shut that off and then converge, which is the executing piece of it. And so um, that's really fascinating to me. It's like, how can I access that better? How can I put that into practice more often so that I can, like you said, close the good and be able to open up to actually finishing things. And I've proven to myself I can do it in other areas. So I think that's kind of the journey I'm on right now is learning how to give this more of a space to, to give it a chance to succeed instead of just like throwing goals at the wall every day. Like, I feel like I'm putting out fires in the goal department. It's not um, Got it. more so. It's not like yeah. I'm picking it here ahead of time and working toward that. Yes. And there's certain rules. And this is where folks were taming these strengths so that we have them, they don't have us. And we've even had to had to do it recently at Metanoia, where now we've conformed more to an EOS way of doing things, uh, entrepreneurial operating system. So Gina Wickman, his book Traction, talks about quarterly rocks. Like you have a meeting where you establish what are those quarterly rocks, those things that you are going to accomplish, your focuses, your clear goals that you're going to have for the next quarter. And when you're done with that meeting, in order for this to be an effective meeting, a wall goes up and you are neither allowed, you're allowed, you're not allowed to throw another rock over that wall or a hand grenade over that wall. You stick with what you've selected and that's part of the discipline. And that's how you ensure that you get things done and you don't live in the land of visionary whiplash. Talia, I see uh, your hand up. Go ahead. You can have closing, closing remarks. Yeah, so actually some players locked in and I'm realizing I'm having a really hard time focusing on you because I'm like being drawn to the players. So that was really funny. I'm like kind of like anxious. Um, but I think this is really good to me and like knowing that like it's my 25, so it's pretty low. And also mm -hmm. just being sanguine, you know, of vice is forgetful, lack follow through, easily distracted. And so to not compare myself with someone I work with in the same office every day is really healing to know it's his thing. Um, and just that, yeah, it doesn't mean that like I have to try to be that way. And it's not that I can't focus because I can mm -hmm. focus on certain things. Um, so that's, yeah, just to not compare, I think is good. Right. And the beautiful and thing about what you, yes, beautiful thing about what you just shared there, Tilly, is, is you've, you, you've got a way for creating that space again for, for your counterpart, Tyler, there to step into his lane and do his work and live in his gifts. And then, you know, even right now, like maybe this is, uh, this is just amazing to hear. It's like, ah, I'm, I'm aware there's this pole that's going on over here and this is where I desire to be. Okay. So uh, the Lord has designed you that way. So how do we create space to just an, an environment that allows for that and boundaries that allow for that? Thanks so much, Talia. 
All right, folks, kind of wrapping it up here, but uh, this has been a great call. Hope you learned a little bit more about focus and how to live it more virtuously. We put this podcast together because we want to have Catholics, Christians, those people that are in religious organizations that are employing Clifton strengths to become uh, more focused on help uh, creating space for people to live in the areas of natural giftedness. We wanted this to be a resource for you. So please share it with other people that you know that are loving strengths uh, and want to know how to employ our strengths to be kingdom building, uh, really focused on that kingdom building activities. And again, if you want to join this call, we're in the Metanoia Catholic Academy. Go to catholiccoaching.com. That's catholiccoaching.com. Join the Academy. Every Tuesday, we get, get, get together and we have one of these calls. All right. So really enjoyed everybody being here. Thank you so much. And we're signing off. God bless.